Today is April 16th, 2021. I am Dr. Kashana Soldier, and I am interviewing Joseph Kenner as part of the African American Oral History Project. Can you state your name for the recording, please? It's Joseph Kenner, President and CEO at Grayston. And where did you grow up, Joseph? I grew up in Southern New Jersey in a place called Burlington Township. It's about 30 minutes from Philadelphia, actually. And who did you grow up with? So I'm an only child, so both of my parents are from the South, uh, North and South Carolina to be exact, but I was an only child. And can you tell us a bit about the neighborhood that you grew up in? It was a middle-class neighborhood, I would say predominantly people of color, but a very uh, thriving middle-class neighborhood where everybody knew everyone. Can you tell me about some of your fondest childhood memories, uh, either where you were or what you were doing at that time? Oh boy, how much time do we have? Uh, Plenty. <laughs> going, going to the South and visiting my grandmother, um, North Carolina, uh, Christmas, um, that was a big holiday for us. I would say Thanksgiving is probably the biggest holiday for us because all of my mom's side of the family would get together. And if you think about that, my mom is one of nine and my grandmother was one of nine. So you can think about those family reunions and how large that is and was at that time. Uh, it was just a great time. And growing up, did you attend any churches or places of worship? I did. Uh, I grew up in a church called Tabernacle, Tabernacle Baptist Church. It's in Burlington as well, Burlington City, which is a different municipality, but very close to our home. And do you have any memories growing up uh, within the church or attending the church? You know, oh boy, again, how much time do we have? I mean, it's going to Sunday school uh, with your Sunday school friends, uh, just being in that church environment, which was very close because I literally grew up in that church from the moment I was born to the moment I left for college. That was my church home. Uh, so, you know, they seen me through every you know, stage of my life and even provided uh, me with a scholarship, uh, you know, small scholarship when I went to college too. So it was a very important part of our lives. So you said you were sort of involved up until you went to college. Can you tell us a bit about your choice uh, and tell us a bit about what brought you uh, to Yonkers as a part of oh. that <laughs> Again, that is a long story, <laughs> loaded, loaded question. Um, so I went to college at Williams College. It's in Williamstown, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I found the college um, and I was looking at a whole bunch of other colleges before that, you know, Princeton, Lafayette, all these different colleges. Um, and I found uh, Williams, I stumbled on it to be quite frankly, um, it was uh, in Reading Money Magazine, I don't even know if they still publish that, where I saw, and they were doing a series on colleges, so the number one colleges in the country at the time, and I saw this article on one guy who passed over Harvard to go to this place called Williams College, and I was like, what guy gives up Harvard to go to some place called Williams? And when I did research and looked up Williams, it was like a smaller school. It had my major, which was political economy. Princeton had that as well. Princeton was my first choice, by the way, but it was a smaller school. So Williams, we only have, you know, 1,200, 1,500 fo folks in total, whereas you could have that many in the freshman class at Princeton. And I wanted the small college environment. And I um, also wanted, they, they had my major, both schools had my major. So it was like a perfect fit. You know, I still qualified to attend there. So I applied to Williams. I applied early, by the way. And did any of those experiences shape where you are today? Yes, I mean, because you're, it was a different environment than what I grew up in. So you had a, a multitude of folks from all over the world, um, which, you know, I didn't have growing up in grade school or high school. So, I mean, literally all over the world, Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, I met somebody from Cyprus <laughs> while I was there. So it was just an, an amazing experience in terms of that level of diversity. Um, so then different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, certainly a lot of wealthy individuals. Uh, so from that sense, it exposed me to a whole new world of, you know, folks and uh, lifestyles that I just had not been used to. And I think it added to the richness, of all, but it also opened my eyes to like what else is out there. I was always one who liked to travel and I got to do that um, and visit some of my friends who came from different countries while I was there. And I actually did a year abroad at Oxford. Uh, so that was exciting. So you spoke a bit about 
kind of moving around both in yeah. the United States and abroad. What brought you to Yonkers? Boy, so that's a long story. Um, what brought me to Yonkers, so I, after college, I graduated um, in 1996. And what brought me to New York was my first job as an insurance underwriter at Chubb and Son, um, which is still around. Um, I was there for about three years um, and left there to go to Lehman Brothers, which was now defunct <laughs> investment bank. They fell apart during the um, mortgage crisis. Um, I was an insurance analyst there for about three years, just over two years, three years. Um, after 9-11, I left there. Uh, this was, I did part-time business school uh, from Chubb to Lehman Brothers. So when I just about to get my master's in business, I went to Pepsi. Um, and I was there for whew, almost 10 years, over nine, but almost 10 years. And I did insurance, risk management, sales strategy, capital markets. I did all of these different things at Pepsi and left all of that all together um, in 2010 to go into government and did four years as a senior advisor to our county executive and then four years as the deputy commissioner for the Department of Social Services for Westchester County. It was during that time that I met a few people from Grayston, which is where I am now. Uh, one woman who I'll never forget, she passed away subsequently, uh, Catherine Harris, um, lovely woman. Uh, she was a former client. She, she was on BSS. Uh, she had come to Grayston to get workforce development training, get job placement services. She actually ended up being becoming an employee of Grayston, starting her own business. She was about to write a book. I mean, she was crazy. She, I think she even had her own uh, beauty salon. Uh, she was just an amazing woman. And she told me, and I'll never forget this, she said, I want my kids to grow up never knowing the different social services acronyms. Uh, she wanted them to you know, be independent and self-sufficient. And I'll never forget that. And she brought me to Grayston. Uh, to learn about and I and I ran employment for the Westchester County and I had never heard of Grayston and didn't know what they did but like I was so impressed by her and her story and what she was doing here I came here and I visited and just got to see the bakery where we practice open hiring which is basically no questions asked uh, employment you just put your name on a list and when the next job comes available you get it no questions asked no background checks and I just I just thought that, like, how is that even possible? Like, we would never do that at Pepsi. We certainly wouldn't do it at Lehman Brothers or Chubb, but um, they were providing all these amazing opportunities to uh, the folks uh, here in Southwest Yonkers. So I just thought it was an incredible company. Never knew how I would ever come work here, but I didn't think too much about it. But while I was at the Department of Social Services, I was part of a committee. I was running a committee called the New York Fathering Conference and did that for four years, actually. But every year we would have keynote speakers, we'd do workshops, and I invited the then CEO at the time, Mike Brady, to be one of our keynote speakers. Uh, so we kind of developed a relationship from that, seeing how we could partner together. But it was the year of 20, I guess it had to be 2017. Um, I was looking for planning the next conference. And I spoke to Mike about um, having somebody from his workforce development team become a, uh, a workshop presenter for us. And he said, sure, I can get somebody to do it the, you know, next year for you if that's what you need. And he said, also, by the way, I'm also looking for a uh, vice president of programs. If you know of anybody, let me know. And I had no idea, Tishana, what a vice president of programs did, uh, to be quite honest with you. But I did some research on it and uh, looked at the job description and it was everything that I did in my life, you know, you had to have a business background, financial background, connections to the government, you know, able to uh, help raise money, all those things was part of my life. So I was like, you know what, I could do this job. I even showed it to my wife and she was like, oh yeah, you could definitely do this. So as they say, the rest is history. I started uh, February of 2018. Um, Mike uh, then resigned probably late 2019. And um, as president and CEO, the, the board conducted a search. Uh, I threw my hat in the ring and was appointed in April 2020, the height of the pandemic. <laughs> and what a transition to make. <laughs> a daunting one. Just throw that in there. I'll just throw that in there. Yeah, I had the pandemic. I became president CEO for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess my follow up question to that is what has that experience been like? There's so many amazing things that Grayson does, especially. Yeah in a time where services like the ones you provide are needed. Can you tell me a bit about that experience? 
you know, the experience is a book in the making. Because uh, like so many other leaders at that time, we didn't have a playbook. I mean, we have 100 people at the bakery, we have, you know, about 30 or 40 here at the foundation. And it was just how are we going to keep the place running? What happens if somebody comes down with COVID and we have to shut down? We have one facility that provides, you know, 12 million pounds of brownies, you know, to folks like Ben and Jerry's Unilever for their global supply chain. And, you know, for folks like Whole Foods, like what happens if we go down? And, you know, it, it really taught me, I mean, so many lessons. I have to start writing this stuff now. But the one lesson was just like, when you know who your leaders are, you will learn very quickly in a crisis who your leaders are. Um, and P.S. at that time, when I was, after I became CEO, I did a lot of restructuring. So we had let some folks go so to the point where I was the only member of the executive team at the foundation. We had had seven members on our executive team. We were down to two by design, but down to two. Um, so it was myself at the foundation and then my, my lead at the bakery, the VP GM, he was running the bakery. And it was just literally the two of us running this company. And I tell you, that's when I learned who the strong people were. And if it wasn't for Rich and you know the team at the bakery, I don't know how we would have done it, but instituted the protocols that were needed, tried as, as best we could to keep people uh, sane because <laughs> a lot of folks were dealing with anxiety, not just from coming to work, but things were happening at home. Eventually Yonkers became the epicenter in Westchester County for COVID. So it was just, there was just a lot of anxiety and just being able to keep the team, you know, comfortable with our protocols, comfortable that the place was safe. And we were deemed essential workers at the same time. So having, making sure they understood what that means, like why are some places shutting down, but we're still running. But at the end of the day, we didn't stop running. We ran through July 4th, we ran through Memorial Day, making over 40,000 pounds of brownies a day. Um, and at that time, uh, this was a tailwind for us from a business standpoint, because people all over the globe were eating those pints of Ben and Jerry's ice cream in record numbers, by the way. And I, I love to say like, you know, the people that were once deemed uh, unemployable were now essential uh, because we needed them, the customers needed them, our, uh, the, the consumers needed them and they delivered. And last year was a record year on all levels, production, volume, everything. It was just a record year. And they did it. Uh, so there's just so many lessons learned. And it, it just teaches you how you have to, somehow you have to like be calm as well. Because, you know, I always say I would compare myself to a duck. You're like, I might look calm on the outside, but there's like a lot of activity going on on the inside. And it's just that uh, it was, yeah, it was an amazing period. And, and we are still standing, still doing well, and uh, just very proud of the team, what they accomplished. So with a record year and working, I'm sure, countless hours, what do you do with your spare time? Is there anything you enjoy doing outside of work just for yourself? Well, I mean, we still continue to be involved in my church, continue to have a strong, you know, spiritual life from a Christian standpoint. I think that's what keeps me stable. We have, we have a four-year-old, um, Antonio, who is, you know, that, that's, you know, what this is really all about at the end of the day, because I could change titles, I could change jobs, but you know, the, your family's going to be your family. So that's, that's the permanent fixture in my life. So that's what keeps me going. And, you know, one day going on vacation, <laughs> a real vacation <laughs> involving passports in another country. But. Absolutely. So besides your sort of free time, Grayson also is really centered within the community. Are there any community service projects that you're particularly involved in? Uh, either in Yonkers or beyond Yonkers as a city? Well, there are a few things that we, as from a, compu a community perspective, so we have the for-profit bakery, Grayston Bakery, but we also have our nonprofit Grayston Foundation, which is very much focused on workforce development. Um, and I always say we, we, we focus ourselves on the lower end of the employment spectrum. So those folks that don't have work history or have some type of barrier to employment, but also we want to focus on those middle skills folks who they might have their high school diploma, but they don't have a degree and they might need some additional trainings. So our focus is on making sure we get folks trained in emerging industries, giving them, you know, nationally recognized credentials that can get them into, you know, very good paying entry level or middle skills jobs that puts them on a path to uh, thriving both professionally and personally. And then also, you know, part of the foundation's mission is to see our model replicated. 
in other contexts. Um, so seeing open hiring uh, uh, practice in places like the body shop, which was one of our first pilots, they started doing open hiring in 2019. Um, at one of their distribution centers in Raleigh, North Carolina, and then brought it to uh, all of their retail operations in the U.S. and Canada. Um, you know, we now have six pilots going with the Body Shop, a place called Clean Craft, which does custodial services, uh, Rhino Foods that provides the cookie dough for the Ben and Jerry's ice cream, uh, Giant Eagle, which is a grocery store chain in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Arbonne, which is a consumer products company in California. So over 1,200 opportunities are being provided through these uh, pilots that are doing open hiring and you know, removing barriers to employment for the folks that need it most. And you know the qualitative, which is like the feedback we hear from folks, um, how their lives are changed, because a lot of folks didn't know how to write a resume or they didn't know how to interview or whatever. They didn't they weren't able to put their best foot forward in terms of getting a job. So they were always denied opportunities. This gave them that opportunity. So that's amazing. And then to hear folks like the body shop say like their turnover rate was cut by almost two thirds, you know, productivity went up 13%. So the quantitative was even more impressive, but our goal is when you look at the whole United States, you have about 10 million folks who have some type of barrier to employment, um, both adults as well as opportunity youth. And they're out of the workforce. They're not even included in the unemployment numbers. They're the reason why we have one of the lowest labor participation rates since Jimmy Carter, you know, the 70s. Uh, how do we get those folks employed? We want to impact that number. And you know, we're we were calculating that, you know, if we just did less than 1% of that 10 million, like 40,000 jobs, that's three billion dollars of impact for this country if we could provide opportunities to the folks that need it most. Uh, that's huge. And that is gonna be our mission, our vision for the next you know, 10 years or so to 2030. With so many different programs that are impacting <clears throat> different demographics in society, and then also thinking about some of the unrest in American society, whether yeah. it's uh, Black Lives Matter, whether it's injustice, whether it's economic, what would you say about your experience as a man of African-American descent moving through the world, but then also reaching out and empowering uh, people who look mm -hmm. like it, it was a lot of cost, especially during the pandemic, where you heard about all of the inequality with health care, job loss. And then you had George Floyd's uh, murder happen. I mean, that really caused me to pause a little bit and as I was reading, you know, all the companies started putting out their statements and, you know, making the black squares on social media. And I, me as a black male, <laughs> president, CEO, <laughs> black male, president, CEO of a social enterprise. <laughs> I, I, it caused me to really reflect a lot on just myself and on this organization that we have. And what I realized, um, I didn't have to come out with a new diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. I didn't need to hire a chief diversity officer or make some I, what I felt were empty statements about uh, what was happening. And I, I realized, you know, we have always been a part of the solution since 1982, which is when we started. And we will continue to be a part of the solution. Uh, we don't need to do anything new per se, or like roll out, you know, I am the chief diversity officer and my executive team, they're the, the chief diversity officers, the managers uh, are the chief diversity officers, our board. Um, and I put my team up against anybody, you know, 30% of our board are persons of color, nearly half are women. If you look at our open hires, 95% are people of color. You know, of that 70 are African-American, 30 are Hispanic. We're doing what we do, and it's the same for our clients. I mean, we service the black and brown communities. Uh, but we're just going to double down and do what we've always done. And that's provide employment opportunities to folks, uh, see that this model gets replicated so that other companies can do it because, you know, we're small. I, I only have about 70 jobs that are open hires. Um, but if I can get more body shops, giant eagles, clean crafts, rhino foods doing this type of hiring and impact that 10 million number, that's the goal at the end of the day. Um, so it's really doubling down on doing what we all have been doing for the last, you know, nearly 40 years and, you know, being proud about it.
and just telling everybody about it. And in that experience of both sharing the word, but then also working with different communities, what's your vision uh, in the future of Grayston, sort of your continued engagement within the community of Yonkers, mm -hmm. but then maybe also its role within Westchester County? Yeah, role within the world. Uh, so we just completed our, um, now that I have a full executive team, we have four of us now, um, and we have a nice full board. Uh, we had a virtual strategic planning uh, meeting back in February, I guess it was, where we rolled out a 10-year vision. We rolled out a three-year strategic plan. And the first is just to be, you know, the noted leader uh, and champion of stakeholder capitalism and showing how business can be a force for good. And every business has to decide for itself which lane it wants to play in. Our lane is employment and inclusive hiring. Um, we want to be that noted champion, and which takes us to the second point. So it's you no know, champion of stakeholder capitalism, but then being you know, a recognized leader as well in this space of inclusive employment, um, leading with open hiring, but talking about how you can just eliminate other barriers to employment. Some jobs require a bachelor's degree. Why? Uh, when you can learn things on the job. So it's like looking at all these different things. Some jobs, we were talking to one of the companies in Pennsylvania, they had all these ergonomic requirements and they were like, I don't even know why we have this. So it's like taking a look at things and how we might be excluding folks from the employment environment and um, just getting rid of them. Uh, so we wanna be the noted leader as well in employment hot and inclusive hot employment as well as workforce development. And then the third is the one that I already mentioned is tackling that 10 million figure. Uh, let's make a crack. Obviously not everybody is going to be able to work because some folks just have issues that just are, are insurmountable, but 1%, can we impact 1% with that 10 million figure and unlock $3 billion of economic impact? I'd love to see it be 10%, but let's start. This is a, it's a, it's a radical concept. I know for some people open hiring, but maybe there's another flavor of inclusive hiring that folks can do, but we wanna tackle that. We wanna tackle that figure and unlock that $3 billion of impact. So noted stakeholder capitalism champion, noted leader in employment, inclusive hiring, workforce development, and then unlocking $3 billion of impact by giving people job opportunities. Absolutely. And that's and that's everywhere. I mean, that's here, that's other states, that's the world. We have, I should have mentioned this, a partnership with a foundation, nonprofit foundation called uh, Start. And they have 21 pilots going in the Netherlands. Now, it's smaller scale, but still, everybody's looking for how they can provide opportunity in their own context. And that's really what we want for people to be creative. So you just talked a bit about creativity, but also sort of global impact. And yep. this project is sort of a local lens, but with a big impact. Yeah. And it grew out of its roots with celebrating Black History Month. And I was wondering if you could share with us what it means to you uh, as a mm -hmm. month, or are there any figures that you look up to uh, both during the month, but every month of the year? Yeah, I, I would say every month. I mean, I actually have a practice uh, during Black History Month. I do like to watch a lot of the documentaries on the, whether it's the civil rights movement or just uh, business leaders that have uh, broken barriers. I think of like Ursula Burns at Xerox, you know, now to, to Sonda uh, Duckett Brown, who's now going to be head of TIA CREF. And oh boy, and uh, I'm forgetting the new CEO of um, Boots, um, who was at um, Starbucks, but all of these amazing leaders that are just breaking barriers. Uh, I'd like to take that time during that month to kind of just focus on that. But it's really, for me, it's every month because those are those are my clients. The people out here are, you know, that's Black History Month for me, getting folks and Black History Year, <laughs> day, you know, week for me is making sure we get folks uh, jobs and making sure that, and sustainable jobs, you know, living wage jobs, you know, jobs that have a career path. I mean, that is the focus for me um, and, you know, when we do that very well, that says so much for, for this organization, but really the people that have uh, resolved to say that they want to succeed, uh, they just need some support because we didn't all grow up with the same type of social capital that uh, I had and, and perhaps you had, I don't know your story, but not everybody's had that. So some folks just don't know how to get started. And you know, for those of us who've had that opportunity, like, we have a responsibility to pass it forward. So in the spirit of passing it forward, are there any parting words of advice or encouragement that you'd like to share with our audience? 
No, I would have them go to graceton.org and learn about us. Um, and I always tell people, you know, it's, it's buy, donate, replicate. You can buy our brownies online at graceton.org. Or if you happen to own a, a frozen dessert company, we would love to be a brownie inclusion in that. Um, and it's also donate. Uh, we have a nonprofit. Um, so all these trainings that we do for folks, um, those require resources. Um, we want to see those expanded. So We'd love to have the support of folks and then replicate. I mean, even if you own a small business and you only have two employees, make one of those jobs an open hiring employee and uh, let's impact those 10 million folks looking for work but have barriers. So buy, donate and replicate. Thank you, Mr. Kenner. It's an honor just to sort of be in this bubble with you, <laughs> uh, but also thinking about all the important work you do in Yonkers and beyond. Thank no, you. thank you for giving me the time.